Lita is in the back and she will happily bring you one. And we also have some maps and some other information um, which you should have over on the podium. So if you're missing something, it'll be in one of those two places. Um, if anyone would like to sign up for a public comment, Angelita, who was standing in the back looking so professionally holding the blue folders, would be happy to help you with that as well. All right, so um, Senator Setzler, would you come up and present your bill, please? Bring before you today Senate Bill 338. Um, as I think you see in your package, this is a reapportionment plan for the Cobb County Board of Education. Um, why do we have this now? Um, in 2022, uh, this General Assembly passed House Bill 1028, which was a reapportionment plan for the Cobb Board of Education, signed into law by the governor, and in a series of actions by, by a variety of plaintiffs, uh, that reapportionment plan for the Cobb County Board of Education was struck down in the federal district court here in Atlanta on December 14th of this year. Um, in, in that, and there's, there's a whole lot that went into that order, the judge's order, Judge Eleanor Ross, um, and part of that order initially was designated that the General Assembly should enact a new plan by January 10th, which was the third day of our legislative session. As we all know, that is procedurally not possible. That was followed by another order that uh, suggested January 22nd, or order that tw January 22nd would be the date. That was enjoined by the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. Those motions are all still in dispute, but what stands before us today is still the re requirement to enact a reapportionment plan for the Cobb County Board of Education. A federal judge has ordered us to do so. The only thing that's, that's really um, one of the things that is in dispute, what date we're ordered by, by the federal court to complete this action. But with all that set aside, we've got an obligation to enact a plan for the Cobb County Board of Education so that for the 2024 election cycle, our school board members that are on the ballot um, have clarity. Our Board of Elections has time to implement a plan so that we can have an organized, thoughtful, well-run election that when qualifying happens in March and the election happens in May, all this is settled and we've got a solid plan to work, move forward with. What you see before you in Senate Bill 338 does exactly that. It takes the order of Judge Eleanor Ross um, and takes the specifics of that and implements that in the plan that you see before you. Um, this plan is, um, addresses the issues raised in the federal uh, court order and also follows standard best practices for reapportionment. In this process, uh, we'll bring this before, this before you today. Um, we've had, um, we had two meetings of the Cobb delegation where this was really the, the central discussion. The first day of session, January 8th. Uh, another day, January 9th, we talked about reapportionment plans. There's a House member that had a plan as well that was presented and talked about. Um, but this plan has moved through the Senate, um, went to, the, again, the, Senate, the committee that handles uh, these issues, passed out 401. Uh, we had a full hearing day, had a follow-up day for vote. So this has been through two meetings of our delegation where the public was invited. It's been through two hearings of the state and local government committee of the Senate and passed the Senate um, with uh, appropriately to move this forward to the House. Um, again, the principles used to build this map, I'll go through very quickly, Madam Chair, and I'm certainly glad to take questions from members of the committee. Uh, one of the things that, again, we was, was front and center in this effort was the federal judge's order. Secondly, when you look at this plan, uh, District 3 uh, in the south of the county, south and west, uh, in the 2012 plan that has been in place for a decade was a designated voting rights act district, uh, a majority black district under the Voting Rights Act that was maintained under this plan. Um, and the other districts, you can see um, the bold lines you see an outline within your Cobb County um, boundaries, those are the existing plan that's been in place. And what you see in the, the colored masses, those are the actual districts that are proposed under Senate Bill 338. 
principles we used in this, of course, again, outside the order of the federal judge, or in addition to that, that we would call best practice for reapportionment include compactness, split precincts, core retention, census-defined areas, slash communities of interest. Uh, Madam Chair, again, as I said, um, we had an obligation under the Voting Rights Act to maintain the majority black district in the southwest of the county. That's been maintained. In fact, you can see the lines of District 3 are very similar to the lines that were in place from 2000, the 2012 plan. Um, from there, um, you can see that um, the, there's compactness. The, the, these, these districts are more compact than the existing plan that's in place and way more compact than the 2022 plan that was struck down by the courts. Split precincts, currently the, the, the 2012 baseline plan has 22 split precincts of the more than 100 precincts in Cobb County. Um, the plan that was struck down by the courts had more than 20, had 30 some split. This goes from our current splits of 22 to nine. So this is a very, very um, well thought through plan with respect to maintaining precincts Communities of interest, Madam Chair, and I'll wrap up with this. I won't drag this out too long, but just for members of the committee to hear this. Census-defined areas, there, there are four census-defined areas that are split in the 2012 plan. Um, the, this has five, um, one, of the, the last, one of the splits being the city of Kennesaw. There's a small sort of outcropping of Kennesaw that crosses Interstate 75 that was split to maintain um, sort of territorial integrity in this. So it's really, it's from, from a since it's fine area perspective about the same as our current plan. Um, and for the metrics of core retention, there was a claim in the, you know, there, there's a discussion in the um, court's order about moving minority voters from one precinct, from one voting district to another, excuse me. Um, from the perspective of core retention, we looked at not only overall core retention, but the movement of different groups, be they blacks, whites, Hispanics, across voting districts, and the plan you see before you addresses that specifically numerically, and I can provide numbers to speak to that if they're specific questions, so that we're address, squarely addressing the, the questions raised in the court order, so that what you have here, I believe, is a solid balanced plan. Um, there's other plans moving around that, uh, you know, there, there's fo folks have have made all kinds of accusations about different plans and approaches, but this is one that we did our homework, um, sat down with our reapportionment office and made the changes that are needed to kind of get this meeting all the standards our reapportionment office requires, and it's something I would commit to you and take questions for, Madam Chair. Thank you so much um, for explaining your bill to us today and for being here with us today. Um, let's see. Well, what happened to them? They disappear? There we go. All right, the board disappeared on me for a moment. If I apologize, um, recognizing 63, which I believe is going to be Whip Park. Okay, go ahead. Thank, you. thank you, Madam Chair. Could I get a first? Uh, could I get a copy of the map and some of the information as well? I, don't, I got the bill, but not the. Uh, oh, thank you, Representative Lott. Uh, so, uh, Representative, or I'm sorry, Senator Setzler. I forgot you're not in our chamber anymore. Uh, can I ask you a few questions um, about both kind of the situation along with process? Would that be all right? Sure. Uh, so uh, first, could you just clarify for me, uh, you know, for what reason was HB 1028 specifically struck down for by a federal court judge? Well, I've got the order here. I uh, would commit it to members. Um, I think it's pretty well documented. She, she, you know, questions were raised, and I don't want to characterize a a court order that is um, 34 pages long in just a sentence or two. I, th I think it's pretty well documented. I, 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 again, I, not, not, not in any way to summarize, but to touch on some of these was this, this issue of compactness and, and the, the, the movement of people around in districts in ways that the judge thought was inappropriate. Senator Setzler, if, if, if I may, is it not true that a federal court judge struck down HB 1028 for being racially discriminatory? in which every single member who voted for that bill voted for a bill that was racially discriminatory. Is that not true? There was, it, those words were used in the judge's order. Um, that order is working its way through the appellate court, so I think it would be inappropriate to 
characterize it definitively as that. That was certainly, those words were used in the order. Um, I think as it works its way through the courts, the, the appellate courts may have a different opinion of the map, and I certainly would have a different opinion. Um, but without respect of what that map was ruled on, this map substantively, substantively remedies those things in a way that will decidedly not be racially discriminatory. So, so Senator Settler, uh, Setzler, uh, you know, just trying to make clear the facts and as to why we are here, in which the legal grounds for which that bill was struck down for being racially discriminatory is why, it being, that being my understanding, is why we have to redraw these maps. Is that not correct? To be clear, the district judge's ruling on December 14th um, stated that in the, the, the court's opinion, the, the district court's opinion, um, there were elements of the, of the 1028 map that were racially discriminatory. As it works its way through the appellate courts, we'll see if that's actually upheld and is deemed to be true or if that's just an um, inaccurate um, supposition. Um, until that issue is settled, that's not the status of 1028. That's simply the, the, the finding of a district court that has had some provisions of that order already enjoined by the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. And until that's settled in the federal courts, I think we can all recognize that is not a settled question. C certainly, I would defer to uh, the appeals court judge as to what his determination is, just trying to get a clear understanding as to what the district court judge said in, in uh, that opinion. Um, now, may. Just to talk a little bit about uh, process and procedure, certainly when it comes to both local laws and, and general laws, if, if I recall, I believe HB 1028 was passed uh, back in 2022 through a process that I certainly had very concerns with, which if I recall, uh, I questioned the integrity of those proceedings in which a local law was forced through without a majority uh, of, of the local delegation supporting that local bill. Now, my understanding for the most part is that when you deviate from the legislative process, uh, especially when it comes to uh, maps regarding redistricting, that could be considered as a factor uh, with respect to any additional violations of the Voting Rights Act. Um, and so can you speak a little bit to the process in which a bill coming out of the Senate that passed, I believe, as a general bill, is that correct? Or did it pass out of the Senate as a, set, as a local bill? To the member, you've got a lot of questions you've packed in. I'd, li I'd like to answer your questions if I could. Yes, sir, please. Um, so, um, and again, I'll, I'll the force through, I won't accept the premise. I think, that, think that's, that's colored, colored language. Uh, let's, let's talk substantively, let's talk process. Yes, of course. The process for enacting, passing bills to the legislature, as many know, um, is a bill is introduced to committee uh, when it's ruled on by majority of the committee members, person with the committee rules and the, and the, the body's rules that moves to the rules committee and onto the floor for a vote. That is the process. Now, there is an accelerated process uh, for uncontested bills and resolutions that sidesteps that process. It goes around committee, it goes around the rules committee, and goes automatically to the floor for a vote, and that happens when there's an overwhelming majority of members from an area affected that sign on to a bill that is able to bypass the typical ordinary process on an accelerated process to the floor. What happened in 1028 um, that, again, I, I don't want to cast any, any, any aspersions on our federal judge's understanding of the details of our legislative process, but the process is committee rules floor, committee rules floor, Governor's signature, as you well know. Um, this idea that the, the local delegation process is somehow the process, that's the accelerated shortcut for uncontested bills and resolutions. I think it's, it's very clear about that. So having said that, um, what, we did, what we've done in this bill, is we introduced it to committee, Madam Chair, um, had a hearing, public comment, had another hearing, voted it, went to rules, went to the floor. That is the legislative process. And to suggest otherwise is to misportray to a public who's trying, who's looking to us for clarity on what the real legislative process is. I think you've, I think you've mischaracterized that, Madam Chair. Well, and I, again, I'd be, be glad may to take- I, may, I, may I interject? You described the process in which it has gone through the Senate. The House has different rules and different processes to get bills through. 
one of the rules um, that was brought in after you were um, you had left us to go to the Senate um, is Rule 18-1, whereby a committee meeting can be held at the discretion of the chair. Um, you petitioned for that. Um, I think you might need a little clarity on the bill is in local right now. That is where it was assigned. We went through the clerk's office to verify that was the correct place to be and legislative council. But each body can determine whether how the bill is handled in their body. Yeah. Just to clarify for you, Whit Park. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the Thank clarification. You. So, 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 so Madam Chair, be, be, be glad to take questions, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, may I ask uh, another question just on process, if I may? So, so uh, Senator Setzer, I, I, I appreciate um, this exchange because I think it's important, especially for the public, uh, with respect to better understanding the distinction between general law and local law, which is very clearly distinguished in our Georgia State Constitution and very clearly distinguished in many uh, well-established case law, including City of Atlanta v. City of College Park. Now, I certainly wouldn't want to cast aspersions uh, but for the most part, my understanding is that general law is very much different from local law, which is why there is a separate uh, process, not necessarily a fast track. If we're talking about a fast track for uh, you know, legislation, certainly we could talk about privilege resolutions that automatically get added to the calendar and voted on unanimously. But there is, because of the Georgia State Constitution, and certainly we all want to follow our Constitution along with well-established precedent and case law, there is a, not a fast track, but a distinct method to, uh, and process uh, to pass local legislation to ensure that the people and their elected representatives, that they have as much power as possible when it comes to voting on legislation that impacts their lives. So my question, and I, I appreciate again uh, the, the conversation and the back and forth. Does your bill, Senate Bill 338, have a majority of the Cobb delegation signed on to it? The Cobb delegation is a, you have a Cobb delegation that is a um, collection of members of the House. You have uh, Cobb members that re represent part of Cobb County that are, that are members of the Senate. Um, and that whole structure that, in, that authorizes that conversation to even happen, the idea of delegations, is a product of the rules of the House and the Senate's product of the rules of the Senate. If you'll notice, our, our state constitution um, allows process to be decided by the bodies themselves and it binds the bodies themselves. Um, our obligation as members, whether, there's, whether senators in the Senate, House in the House, or if we're working in each other's chamber, is to follow the rules of the House and to follow the rules of the Senate. That is the, uh, in fact, if, if, as the chair um, recognized, this is a sign of this committee and is moving under um, Rule 18.1, and it is consistent with the rules of the House, and the way it moved to the Senate is consistent with the rules of the Senate. That is our legal obligation to our citizens, and we would, we would expect nothing less of this chamber. Senator Setzer, would you not yeah. agree that... Yeah, get, get, get him, Madam Chair, I can take questions from the gentleman. Um, well, I was going to... And we can, we can talk all day on this. I just, again, happy to. I just, if there are other questions, I don't, I don't want to cut anyone else off. If it's the, well, the Chair's pleasure, we can continue the conversation. If, if you have one more, Whit Park, and then we're going to turn it over. We have a whole, the okay. whole board's lit up. A a apologies. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. So, you know, again, my understanding of case law is... And I certainly understand the distinction between legislative rules and how courts interpret rules in which a court of law will distinguish between a local law and a general law in which even if the legislature passes a local law as a general law, a court has and can sever any parts which would not otherwise be compliant with the state constitution in understanding that distinction. Now, again, I, I thought it asked a very simple question. Um, does SB 338 have the requisite number, does it have a majority of the Cobb delegation signed on, which is necessary for that bill to move out of this committee and to be added to the local calendar in compliance with the rules of the House? I, 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 would, challenge yes no the question. I would challenge the premise of what the gentleman was saying, Madam Chair. To move around the committee process, around the rules process, and make it to the floor on the, on the calendar, for uncontested bills and resolutions 
having a majority of uh, members who touch Cobb County is required for that process. That is not required to come to committee, be heard by this committee, acted on by this committee as we are here today. So we are following the rules. There's two processes. There's doing what we're doing today, or there's getting eight signatures to go around this committee and around the rules committee onto the floor on the uncontested calendar. What you're talking about is the process to get on the uncontested calendar um, through a majority of signatures. The alternate course, the, the base course is this, that's the other course. We're choosing course one, not course two, as you've alluded to. All right, thank you so much, Whit Park, for your participation today. All right, um, Representative Lott, I believe you have a question. Oh. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Senator, I have two questions primarily, but one is, um, do the changes in this affect any sitting board members at this time? Dual lady, thank you. Uh, no, uh, this is, it's preserved the incumbency of all of our board members. Ex I think that's an excellent answer. I'm, I was hoping you would say that, but it's not near my district immediately. Sure. So I did want to verify that. And then secondly, and this is sort of just touching on what Whit Park was talking about. I would just love for you to explain to me the process in 2023, 24, I'm so baffled by the fact that we are having uh, a racial conversation on um, the voting districts. Um, the, my, the street that I live on is majority minority. And I think what you're telling me, and I'm just hoping you'll kind of explain why it is the way it is. I live on a street that's majority minority. Are you telling me that when we go in and we start affecting my neighborhood that you are tracking the race of each and every one of the people that I live with near, beside, my neighbors? Um, are you using my race and their race to actually determine something about our election boundaries uh, in the year 2023-24, and why is that? Well, the, the one thing we certainly have a legal obligation to do that we take very seriously is to follow the Federal Voting Rights Act. The Federal Voting Rights Act has one majority of black district in the southwest corner of the county. We followed that. Um, that was a, a, certainly a, an imperative of our, of our process. Um, we, in the reapportionment process, um, you know, racial decisions are not primary to what we do. They, they, they're considerations um, that um, but it's not a, it's, it's not a, it's, it's neither ignored nor is it a focal point. Um, the things we addressed that I alluded to earlier that were specifically uh, addressing the judge's order, uh, looking at the movement of um, black, Hispanic, uh, Asian Pacific Islanders across different um, districts was directly in response to the judge's order. So the judge raised that, so we addressed it specifically. Um, it is a, it's something we're aware of. Um, it is neither an overarching driver or is, nor is it something we ignore. It's, it's, it's one of many factors. Could you just clarify the portion of the Voting Rights Act that you're talking about was written in what year? I don't want to outkick my coverage. I know this, it, it, it dates back to the mid 60s. Um, you know, the, the Voting Rights Act 1965 put in place a whole series of, of, of tweaks. I know it's, it's been changed some, but the, the core, this issue of maintaining majority black voting districts um, without overpacking, just ma maintaining that, that fair balance. You, we, we don't want to dilute those and take them uh, below a majority black district if we can draw one, nor do we want to pack them with, with two. It's, it's, it's maintaining that balance. This map does exactly that. One of the ways we did that, as you can see that existing line of the of the voting um, of the district three was largely maintained with a couple tweaks we had to make to maintain equality of population um, and the precinct boundary integrity. Um, so we took that very seriously. Thank you for your time. All right. Thank you, Representative Lott. And um, let's see, we've got Representative Kim Alexander. All right. You can go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just um, have a couple of questions. Were there members from the House that signed on to this bill? I'm sorry? Were there members of the House that signed on to this? This is a, as you know, this is a Senate bill. Um, right, I'm, I'm aware. Yeah, so we are, we had 50% um, of the senators from Cobb County uh, who represent parts of Cobb County who were co-sponsors on this in the Senate. 
Um, here in the house, uh, the process is, again, as, as, as I alluded to earlier, um, there's, there's two ways forward on local bills. There's to get a majority Sen of- Senator Setzler, I'm gonna stop you on that yeah. one. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right, do you have another I, question? I, I do, and I know you said there's another bill over in the house. Uh, what are the similarities? Have you looked at that? Have you guys discussed that in your delegation since this is coming from the Senate? You're saying there's another bill in the house on this, correct? Yes, ma'am, there, there's a, a house bill that's been filed um, that's, I, I, would, I think it's fair to characterize it, starting its way through the process. Um, discussed the same day we were there. We discussed that plan, discussed this plan um, for nearly three hours over the course of two meetings. Um, and this plan's just, it, it found favor in the Senate. It's moving through the process. And I think, honestly, for the reasons we discussed, I think this plan strikes the balance um, that we need and is something that's worthy of this, this body acting on. Thank you. All right, um, I think Senator Setzler is gonna to take a break. He has to go vote. His, um, his whip is here to get him. Five minutes, okay. All right, um, I, I wanna do a, a clarification. Um, Representative Alexander asked a valid question. Uh, we do have another bill um, that was introduced by the Cobb delegation. It, it is, will be on our next local calendar. Um, it did meet the House requirements. Again, we don't have, I, this committee has no responsibility or, or any ability to enact or affect what the Senate does, as we all know as House members. So um, saying that respectfully, um, our process is a little different. And so um, the House bill does meet all the requirements and it will be on the calendar, which we are planning to do Monday. So I just wanted to make that clear. I know many of you in this room have signed onto that bill and um, just want to make it clear that it will be on the calendar for Monday because it does meet the requirements. The situation um, since um, Senator Setzler has left the room, um, he's a little confused on how this exactly works. I think we discussed this last year in our committee. Um, when we have a bill that comes from the other chamber, we can, as a committee, vote on that bill. And that would make the same difference if it's for or against the bill, however it goes. That would be the same as delegation members signing on it or not signing on it. That would be in lieu of the signatures. And if you have a bill that comes from another body, so I mean, the only place it can come from is the Senate, um, and that point in time, the senator can request a hearing, which is what has happened here. Because this is um, a time is of the essence situation, we are holding this hearing. We just got the bill yesterday or day before? Yes, we got the Senate bill yesterday. So we understand there's a deadline of January 29th based on the judge's order, and we're trying to be very cognizant of that and letting our members have a voice in that. So. Um, We'll just take, I guess, a brief recess. Don't go anywhere, please. Um, Senator Setzler should be right. There he is. That was the briefest recess in any committee history. All right, Senator Setzler, come on back. All right, and thank you all for your comments thus far. Are greatly appreciated. Oh, Representative Alexander, I'm sorry. Had you completed your comments? Okay, thank you, thank you. All right, um, Representative Alessania. <coughs> All right, um, thank you, Chair Lady Camp. Um, Senator Setzler, um, during our last delegation meeting, uh, members, of both, uh, members of delegation of both parties urged you and Representative Anulowitz to work together to come up with a map that serves the interest of COP citizens. And this is just a yes or no, because I have a few questions, so just a yes or no, correct? I'm, I'm going to answer your question if, as, as I, I'm not, not going to, respectfully, I, I'll answer your question. I'm not going to get into yes or no. I, I mean, so. we've, we've got to be respectful of other people, too. She mentioned we have the board leader. Just a yes or no, because I have a few more so we can get to it. Yeah, we, in that delegation meeting, um, discussed both plans. Um, specifics were brought to me in that discussion that said, hey, we'd like to make a change in, in this part of District 7 and District 3, and we talked about high school attendance zones in the north and the south, and all, all, all those things were talked about. And I, I looked at them very substantively, honestly. I went, went in and dug, dug into those issues and concluded that although those were meaningful comments to take feedback on, they were worthy of further investigation and study, which I, I, I pledged you I did, they didn't make they didn't solve the issues 
of the court's, the judge's order in a way that was meaningful and was, was worthy of adoption. Okay, I'm going to rephrase just in a very short way. Did you work with Terry to accomplish this map, Senate Bill 338? Did you work with Terry Anulowitz? I met with every member of our delegation for nearly three hours. Now, what I, what I said very clearly, and I said it, I said it in our meeting, and I said it publicly, I'm not, I, I did not have an ex parte meeting where we ran off in a smoky room and did a deal on a map. I did not do that. In open meetings of a delegation for nearly three hours, myself, yourself, Representative Anulowitz and others talked about these things. We had substantive discussions about specifics of the map, specific high school attendance zones, specific lines, specifics, all of that we talked about. We met for nearly three hours about that. And, I, and from those meetings, carefully investigated the details of those discussions. So yes, we absolutely met for nearly three hours. Okay, so, all right. So the answer is no. We, I'm not talking about a meeting. I was aware of that. There was a conversation that you should work with Terry and that clearly didn't happen. Okay. I challenge your characterization, respectfully, I challenge your characterization of that. We all did right. meet for nearly three hours. So it's important for all of you all here to. All right, you're supposed to address either me or you're as the chair or the person who was testifying, all right. not the body. Okay. So are you finished with your questions? I have one point? more, Shelley, to camp, if okay. I may. All yes, right. Go ahead. All right. So in 20, 2010 census, um, the white population in Cobb County was at 56%. With black and other minorities, um, account for 44% of Cobb population. Now, according to 2020 um, census, blacks and other minorities in Cobb County make up 52% of Cobb population. And that's reflective in most of our elections in Cobb, from the district attorney to county election, county commissioners, and even our delegation in the House, where we have seven House members and f seven House Democrats and five um, House Republicans. So that's reflected in that. Now, don't you think that the map that you have here is not really re reflective of the population shift we have in Cobb County, the SB 338? Well, I would caution the gentleman to consider what he's saying. Um, if you're trying to bring about a partisan outcome, that satisfies your partisan interest, uh, I'm not sure I can help you there. Um, what we're looking to have in these maps are represent communities of interest, not dilute black voting power in the Voting Rights Act district, and maintain the kind of balance the judge calls for in her order. This plan does that. I can't solve your partisan interest. If you're really trying to, if you're trying to conflate this idea of, of um, uh, if, if it's a veiled partisan interest you have, I can't, can't solve that problem for you. I'm following the judge's order in maintaining communities of interest. Thank you, Chair Lady Camp. Oh, thank you so much. And just to, as a measure of decorum, whenever we're addressing um, another member in this committee or a member of this body, if you're referencing them, um, it's just decorum to reference them by representative or by senator. So just a, a measure of decorum. Thank you. All right, um, so um, we're going to hear from Representative Stinson. Let's see. Are you ready? You're away? All right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, Chairman Weedauer. Um, Senator, I'm just curious because obviously this deals with the school board. Where does the school board stand? Does the majority of them support this map? I don't care what the school board thinks, they're no part of this. The school board supported the 1028 map. Um, that was something they had some involvement in. They've had, I've, I've said before, I'm indifferent to what their thoughts are. We work for the citizens of, yeah, I, I work, I serve my constituents, and um, we're trying to about, draw a fair and balanced map. The only thing we thought about with respect to the school board was incumbent retention. We didn't draw anyone out of their, any of the existing incumbents out of their district. That's something we do consider. That's considered a reapportionment best practice, but I am indifferent to their interests personally, their, their, their personal interests. Thank you so much. Uh, Chairman Weedauer, do you have anything further? You're good, thank you so much. All right, um, Representative Gladney, please go ahead with your comments and questions. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, Senator, my question was almost exactly what uh, Chairman Weedauer question was with regard to the school board, what their position was. 
particularly yeah. as it relates to local legislation, uh, the school board members have been elected as well by the constituents that they represent. Mm -hmm. Those people, their voices matter. They have been involved with the communities, the parents and the students. And I'm just curious as to why he would take a position to be dismissive of their concern and why we would not have the opportunity to at least understand what their purview is since we don't, some of us don't live there. Sure. And we are being asked to weigh in on a decision. Sure. Appreciate that. And again, let me let me an, let me answer your question as a continuation of what I said to S Chairman Weedauer. It's not a callous um, disacknowledgement of, of of school board members. Um, we maintained incumbency. We didn't district any incumbent out. Um, it is one of the traditional reapportionment principles. What's called core retention, retaining the the, the makeup of the district where you can, where it makes sense to do that, so you're not making radical shifts one way or the other with our districts. That's something, that's one of the things that the, the, the um, map in 2022, the, the court alluded to this issue of moving too many people around. This, this maintains more what they call core retention, um, particularly in areas that were raised by the court. That's an interest of a school board member. You're not losing 80% of your constituents to be shifted. Or, that's, that, that is one of many considerations. So there's no callousness to our school board members, but I, I would caution you, um, you know, if, if we were not under an order by a federal judge to address some specific things, there might have been a process where we were heavily involving the school board and getting feedback from it, having a very active process. I think one of the problems in 2022, at least in, in the opinion of the judge, was there was an inappropriate collaboration with the school board. Um, that kind of blurred the lines a little bit. So I think as we bring 338, it is a shift from a school board-centric approach that created problems in 2022 to a federal judge's judicial order-centric approach that we're bringing in 338. So there's no callousness to it. It's just a recognition. We really have to listen to the judge now, not to our school board members back home in doing this remedial map. One more question, Madam Chairwoman, please. And thank you very much for that observation and for sharing that. But what I would caution you, sir, as a colleague, as we all serve in this space to do the very best that we can in understanding the timeline. However, as we make decisions, making those decisions in a vacuum and a bubble outside of those who work in the space of of the purview in immediacy. That is how we get into these situations in the first place. Yeah. And so making sure that we stay connected to the school board and those persons who serve in the local spaces, understanding what the needs of the community are, as stated in the question with my, co my colleague, Representative Lott, in her interest in understanding how we move forward in deciding how elections are determined in the spaces where she lives. I can understand the relevance of that yeah. so that we don't lose touch with how we move forward. Thank you very much, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you, thank you. All right, um, Vice Chair Anderson, please go ahead with your question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator, I've got, uh, Madam Chair, if I may, I've got just three short questions, if I may. Senator, uh, first of all, is it not true that redistricting is a purely legislative process? It is a, legis it is a legislative prerogative. Um, I think as legislators, we're called to understand our communities in, in meaningful ways. I think it would be a mischaracterization to suggest that, for example, Representative Evans, who's here with us, to su suggest she doesn't understand her district because she's serving the legislature. I think she does. I think all of us do as senators and reps, and I think the, those local sensibilities that would be expected were brought to bear in drawing this. Okay, and as a follow-up to that, uh, Senator, do you have a House sponsor for this bill? I do. Okay, and uh, who, who would that sponsor be? The Representative Carson. Okay, and is it, is it uh, not true, sir, that uh, Representative Chairman Carson is a member of the Cobb delegation? He is indeed. 
Uh, in fact, he represents a different part of the county than I do. So if this is not, can't be couched as something in part of Cobb County. This is, he represents the northeast part. I represent the northwest part of Cobb County. And uh, this plan got support from senators that represent a wide array of the county. Thank you, sir. All right, thank you. And um, at this time, Chairman John Carson has comment or question, sorry. On. To my friend, this gentleman yield. I do. Thank you very much. Um, I, I just want to just uh, mention, ask a, a couple of things. This meets, as I understand it, this meets the the requirements under the VRA, and it meets the requirements as set forth, but in stipulations from Judge uh, Ross. Correct. It does. It's again, it, it meets the VRA as we discussed earlier with with respect to District Three, uh, maintaining it not diluting it, not packing it, just maintaining it. And uh, the, the issues raised by um, Judge Ross have been specifically and numerically addressed in a, in a meaningful way. And no, for, does the gentleman further yield? Yes, sir. And no incumbents are being um, adversely impacted, is that correct? It, it retains all incumbents in their district. Yes. And it improves what we call the core retention. It, it keeps more of the district for the incumbent in this plan than the districts would maintain in the, in the 2022 plan that was struck down by the courts. They, they keep more of their district in this than they did in the previous plan. Thank you very much. And I, I just wanted to uh, clarify, I have spoken with uh, several members of the Cobb School Board. They, they, uh, it's my understanding, and they, and they, because they've told me, they, they do support this map. They, they, they want resolution <laughs> on this matter. Uh, I, I would just, uh, form that in the question to the senator and uh, as uh, as a question slash statement to the committee isn't that not true senator? well you know again i we don't want to be callous to their interest i just again because of the nature of 1028 didn't want to that this this is not a product of the cobb county school board this was a more of a legislative effort right to the point before um because we're trying to be very attentive to the judge's direction well i i think the gentleman from from Ackworth would agree that we're trying to partner with various local governments and so forth, but it is still a legislative prerogative, yes, is sir. it not? Yes. All right. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, if I may, at the appropriate time, I'd like to make a motion. Thank you. Um, that we certainly, we will consider that. Um, all right. So we had, I had set aside approximately um, 40 minutes for us to debate this, and we're just a little bit over that. Um, so I did wanted to I wanted to allow time for public comment. We do have two members who signed up to speak, so um, we're going to do ten minutes total for public comment. Um, the first to sign up um, is Terry Nolowitz, and so um, if you don't mind coming to the podium, thank you. And your time's not going to start until you get there. Don't worry. Of course. Hi everyone, I am State Representative Terry Anulowitz. I am also the chair of the Cobb County Legislative Delegation. I am in my second year in that role. And I wanted to give a little bit of background clarification and a little bit more context, um, hopefully with far fewer words, uh, regarding the bill that you have before you today. So yes, in March of 22, the governor signed HB 1028. In June of 22, a lawsuit, Finn versus Cobb, well, the Cobb Board of Elections and Registration, was filed in June of 22. That case asserts that the Cobb County, this is a quote, the Cobb County Board of Education in Georgia and state legislators used racial demographic information to, quote, pack communities of color, particularly black and Hispanic voters, into three of seven school board voting districts in order to diminish their political power and preserve a white majority on the board. The goal of the plaintiffs was to block the implementation of this racially gerrymandered Board of Education map that was passed through the general legislative process, not the local legislative process. To note, I, there is a bill that I have filed. It is House Bill 989. The reason it's not for consideration before you is because it does meet all the requirements and therefore per the rules of this 
committee and the rules of the house it is automatically going to go on to the local legislative calendar so on december 14th regrettably right after we concluded the special session judge eleanor ross did go ahead and issue the preliminary injunction and she did put a deadline of january 10th now we know that it is not within the georgia constitution to pass any bill within the within the first three days of the legislative session. I am not particularly interested in sidestepping the Georgia Constitution, and I imagine most of my colleagues are probably in agreement with me on that point. There was an extension to January 22nd. That was day six. Of course, that was this past Monday. It's interesting that there has been conversation about the appellate process and about how this issue is going to continue to work its way through the Court of Appeals. I am curious exactly as to how that will happen as on this past Friday the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals did issue a ruling that the intervener, the Cobb County Board of Education, which was never a defendant in this case, that they do not have standing to move forward with an appeal. So again, I am curious as to how exactly there is going to be any more movement in the appellate courts regarding this preliminary injunction, regarding this lawsuit, because again, the Cobb County School District does not have standing in the case. Now, we had a question from the committee about what you know was race considered? Yes, that is precisely what was considered. In fact, that is at, at the essence of this lawsuit is that a few members of the Board of Education did meet in a room. Was it smoky? I don't know. I wasn't there. Uh, but they did meet to talk about what they wanted their goals to be with this map and what they wanted. And you can find this in the testimony and in the depositions related to this case. They very clearly wanted to preserve the white majority on the board. This is in the court order. It is there. It is in the deposition. So it's it's clear what they were trying to do, right? One of the things the judge also talks about in the order, Judge Eleanor Ross, is that the local process was, quote, sidestepped. There's that adage about the definition of insanity. Trying to do the same thing you're doing, you've been doing, expecting a different result. Why do we expect that a judge who has already said they don't like that the original House bill in 2022 sidestepped the local process. Why do we think that the judge will then think, OK, let's do another bill that sidesteps the local process, right? I mean, I, this is why I'm just so, I'm just, I'm not baffled because very few things surprise me anymore. But I am hoping to convey to the committee the reality that there is not consensus of the local delegation for this Senate bill. There is not the majority support from the local delegation for this Senate bill. Absolutely, it can be considered by this committee. Absolutely, it can be considered by the General Assembly. It has already been considered by the Senate. But I urge you, in light of the context, in light of the information you have received today, in light of the fact that this legislation ha has been met with so much consternation that you at a minimum consider a vote to table this bill so that there can be further discussion about the local process. One of the things that I think is curious too, when, we t when you're considering this legislation and you've been told the numbers about the population movement, are those numbers of population movement that are in Senate Bill 338 based upon the 2012 map from the Board of Education? Or are those numbers of population movement based on the 2022 map, which, as we've discussed, was found to be in violation of the 14th Amendment by the judge? Because when you're trying to make a decision, knowledge is power. The more information you have, the better. And so that's another question I asked you to consider, is when you're talking about the population movement, is that based upon the 2022 bill? that has already been found to be in violation of the 14th Amendment. Again, I think there are enough reasons here to present a compelling case for tabling this bill, and that is what I would ask you to do today. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Anulowitz. Um, at this time, we have another um, public speaker, which is Representative Wilkerson. If you'll come up to the podium, please. And um, 
I hate to sound like um, a timekeeper, but I'm being a timekeeper. You've got a little over um, three and a half minutes. Three and a half minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I want to thank the committee for uh, your time today. I want to thank the committee for your time today. I'm going to go over two quick points here. One deals with process. One deals with the maps themselves. So I'm going to run through this quickly. As far as the process, my understanding is that we have a local delegation process that we have all talked about. This year, we did change the rules to say that the chairperson can call a meeting at any point, but it does not clarify what that meeting is going to be called for. So let me say 18.1 is not clear. My understanding is the interpretation that means that you can bring forth any bill that, for example, say in this case, a minority of the delegation wants to bring forward a map and the rest of the delegation does not, you can petition the committee to ask for a hearing in front of them. But my understanding is that process is put in place only after you have tried the other process. We have Cobb delegation rules, so if you go to section 3.C, uh, it says that every member must, we must do two things. We must have a hearing, which we did. We must also afford each member the opportunity to sign a bill. Multiple people have asked who has been given that opportunity. When a bill comes for the Senate, it should automatically be treated as a local bill as we are, but at the same time, that means we must first follow the local rules, which require that every member be given a chance to sign that bill, which nobody has that I'm aware of. So that's the first part. So for process alone, I would say, please, let's push back on this. Take a few days, ask the members to sign the bill. If they don't, come back to the committee. The risk that we have here is that every local bill could potentially be not signed on by our delegation. So for example, every bill you want to do for your county, for your city, the, ma the majority who has been harmed may decide not to support the minority. That means Kennesaw, that means Ackworth, that means Marietta. Anywhere that does not have the majority of the members could take retribution for the harm that they've done to the families. That's one thing. I'm not saying that will happen. I'm saying that's the risk we do by changing the rules here. The second thing is, we still have the problem of the numbers, and I apologize if I'm rushing, but we have several districts I want to highlight that if you take the numbers from the 2012 maps, they actually fall within the deviation that's required. So if we did nothing, we would still be within that deviation of less than, um, I believe the highest is, um, let me get here, I apologize. The highest is 4% one way and it's negative three the other. So we're still within that deviation if we did nothing today. The problem though is you take certain districts, for example, that shifting lines creates a problem. So for example, District 7 is 47% white, majority minority the other way. That district under the Senator's map goes to 57% white. The same thing, what we're doing is we're, again, packing African Americans in District 3. Anybody that knows Powder Springs knows it's a majority minority city. I mean, it's a majority black city, let me be clear. It's majority black. By putting that into District 7, we went into the Marjorie Taylor Greene problem where we're taking that power of that black population and putting it into an area where they cannot affect the change in that community. You have a black mayor, you have black state representative, you have black state senator, you have a black you know, congressperson that was there before. So what I'm asking for is to turn it down on two things. One, the integrity of the process, because my understanding is this has been done one other time, but even if we want to go through that process, take the time to allow the members to sign. The second thing is we still run into the problem of packing and cracking. I will comment on the last part about the appeals court. The fact that you know, people want to go to the appeals court would be the same as saying that our maps that we passed during the special legislative session don't matter because the plaintiffs can always appeal to the appeals court. A judge has decided what they do. We do what we do. They do what they do. But for that, I want to thank you for your time. I apologize. I spoke quickly. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, I ask you to vote no at a minimum. Vote no today. Bring us back in a few days and let us keep on moving. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Wilkerson, and kudos to you. You did it with nine seconds left. <laughs> That's remarkable. All right, yeah. All right, so, goodness, I don't want it to make that loud noise in the microphone. All right, so, um, let's see. I believe Representative Carson. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. 
Um, all right. If you can briefly, uh, unfortunately. Uh, there were raised that need to be addressed. Um, you know, Representative Nolowitz talked about slowing the process down and let's just just take our time. And we, I, I do think we've been deliberate about this. We've done a lot, done our homework. We've got the numbers to back up what we've done and very carefully done this. Two public meetings with our delegation. Um, we have not rushed this process, but we can't take this whole session. We need to get this thing acted on so it can get put in place so that our Board of Elections can implement these maps. Um, the issue that was raised about, I don't know if this, the, the numbers about movement of um, minority voters is relative to the 2022 map or 2012 map, very important point, very important point. I don't, I don't know how doubt could have possibly been cast in that, in that in, in, with respect to this. The numbers we show about the movement of minority voters, the retention of minority voters is the 2012 existing maps versus what we're proposing today. This, this is not relative to the 22 maps. But appropriately so, we looked at what the voter counts were by different groups ordered by the court in the 2012 maps, and the 2024 maps restore those in this balanced way. So that's, that answers her question directly. Um, I strongly disagree with this, this contention. This is you know, preserving a, a white majority. I think there's, I would just ask members to ask themselves the question, is the fight here really one of preserving, bringing about a partisan outcome that the lady tries to perhaps I'll let you guys decide that for yourselves. Lastly, um, the issue of the school board having standing. Um, this has not been a school board centric process. It's a legislative process uh, with this map. Uh, the court ordered the General Assembly to enact new maps and to do it this month. And um, we're doing that now. And I appreciate the latest consideration. And then lastly, to wrap up, um, you know, this, um, this, this issue of um, Delegation rules, um, the Senate has its own rules, and the Senate followed the Senate's process, as I think we should, and, and any characterization to the contrary is just missing the point. And then um, lastly, that we're certainly very, very sensitive to the maintaining these communities of interest. Um, you know, Powder Springs as a city is largely in District 3. Um, as Representative Wilkerson mentioned, it is a majority black of city. Um, and that's maintained in the majority of black district. I think it's appropriate to maintain that, not try to carve that up and divvy that out as would be inappropriate. So, Madam Chair, I just want to address those issues raised and just be at the pleasure of the committee. Thank you very much for your testimony here today. And um, just wanted to recognize our esteemed members of the Senate um, who um, unfortunately had to come get Senator Setzler to go make a vote. <laughs> Thank you. All right, um, Chairman Carson, I do believe you are requesting to speak. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I want to thank all the members of the committee uh, that are, that are uh, here in this bill. It's very important. Um, I'm looking around to my colleagues, and I think I'm going to be home before most of you get anywhere near home uh, mm -hmm. today. So in light of that, in light of that, this map meets the judge's requirements, the Judge Ross's requirements, it meets the VRA. Uh, guidelines. It has, I can tell you, it has the school board's uh, support, a majority of the school board support. Madam Chair and the committee, I'd like to make a motion, uh, motion do pass. All right, we have a motion and a second, do pass. Any addition? Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, can you uh, clarify for me as we're treating a local bill as a general bill, uh, if this bill does move forward today, will it be added, to, will it be sent to the Rules Committee or will it be added to the local calendar? Thank you. That's, that's a good question and I am happy to clarify that. It will go on the rules, I'm sorry, it will not go to rules. It will be on our local calendar. M Madam Chair, if I may follow up. Yes. Uh, in order to preserve the integrity of House, pre house proceedings and comply with House Rule 56, mm -hmm. Uh, I believe that this should not be added to the local calendar as it would otherwise violate the rules of the House in which the minority otherwise does not have the opportunity in compliance with House Rule 56 to debate this matter on the House floor. All right. Um, regarding your parliamentary inquiry, we're going to confer with Legislative Council. So if you can give us just a moment, we want to make sure that we are not in violation of House rules.
the only thing you can blame my dad for. All right, conferring with legislative council. Um, indicating that we are handling this as a local bill clearly this has been stated in this meeting it is a local bill so as a local bill it will be on the local consent ag agenda um, anyone any member has the right to pull it from the consent agenda and ask for it to be voted on separately and um, at that point in time we would take a vote regarding that matter a point of clarification, if I may, Madam Chair. Yes. Uh, so to ensure that we're not violating, and certainly this committee is not violating House Rule 18.1 mm -hmm. uh, with respect to what bills are added to the local calendar, which my understanding is a majority of the delegation has to sign on in order for it to be added to that calendar, uh, will I still be able to file a minority report and debate this matter if it does reach the House floor? Because otherwise, I, I, again, my concern is that you may either be violating House Rule 18.1 or House Rule 56, in which certainly I wouldn't want to, um, you know, to, to, in order to preserve the integrity of House proceedings, I certainly want to, wouldn't want to see a violation of House rules. Nor would I, nor would I. So um, we're going to clarify that with the clerk's office. Um, to my knowledge, I've only been here since um, 2021. I have not seen a bill pull from the local calendar and um, have a minority report and have it debated, not saying that it's impossible, and it could have very well happened five minutes before I got here, but we will clarify that point, and we will let you know before session. Yes. If, if I may, uh, again, to ensure that we are preserving the integrity of House proceedings, uh, at this time, I would like to make a motion to table this bill before, uh, in order to first receive clarification that we are complying with House Rule 56 to preserve the ability of the minority to debate this bill. Because again, if it's going to move as a general bill, which it should, being my understanding, as uh, Senator Setzler said, that that can move forward in, in this process. Again, I want to ensure that we are not violating House Rule 56. And again, if this, if the local delegation wants to proceed per House Rule 18.1, again, I think clarification as to what then happens given this unprecedented uh, step of treating a local bill as a general bill, I, I would like to make a motion uh, to table that we get additional information before we proceed. Thank you. I, I appreciate that, but unfortunately, your motion is out of order because we've not answered the first motion that was on the table. Um, so at this time, we had a due pass motion and a second. So I guess we're calling the vote. All in favor, please raise your hand. Okay, opposed? All right, thank you. Motion does pass. It was um, 10 to nine. It was 10 to nine. It was a very close vote. I'm sorry? Yeah, 10 to nine. Okay. All right, thank you. I appreciate all of you for your consideration in this matter, and I hope you have a good weekend and safe travels home.